back here in New York, more than 340 of those killed at the World Trade Center on 9-11. They were firefighters. And we want to bring in Al Jazeera Scott Heiler. He visited a fire station in New York, which responded to the calls on that day. Here's their story. Thomas. People here like to think of Maspeth as a small town within New York City. Hey, it's a great place to live. Uh, it's this very small community that uh, you walk down the street and you get to know everybody, uh, you know, whether it be on a work day or uh, an off day. But even with its small town charm, it's connected to the big city. Beyond the obvious geographical ties, Maspeth played a major symbolic role during the 9-11 attacks. This small blue collar community is home to the Firehouse of Squad 288 and Hazardous Materials Squad 1. Ten years ago on September 11th, the Firehouse responded to calls for help down at the World Trade Center. 20 men climbed into their trucks and raced the 13 kilometers to the scene in Lower Manhattan. Only one came back. Of any firehouse that responded to the scene at the World Trade Center, this one in Maspeth suffered the biggest loss. Darlena Manzion's husband is a fireman in a squad near 288. This weekend, she'll be thinking of the Maspeth families who were not as lucky as hers. And they say that 10 years, like this is the big one, it's supposed to be, you know, everybody's supposed to just gather together and, and you know, it's like a healing process, but I, I can't even fathom, you know, I mean, every day that my husband walks out the door, to, you know, to go to work, you never know. They're heroes, they're all heroes. And what they've done is just, you know, amazing. So, I mean, uh, the guys from 288, like I said, and my husband as well, these people weren't even on duty at the time, you know, and I, I think it takes a lot of courage and, you know, uh, it, it, for what they've done to go down there when they're not even working and just to, to, you know, lend a helping hand. And those who lent that helping hand are such a part of Maspeth that the community named their local public school number 58, School of Heroes, to honor those in uniform who lost their lives on 9-11. Okay, welcome back everyone to New York City and the uh, main stage for the 9. Back here, back here in New York, the ceremonies continue. The names of those killed on 9-11 are still being read by family members. We are going to have a moment of silence shortly to commemorate the last tower that fell. But right now we want to talk to Scott Heidler. He is out and about in Queens, New York, talking to people about their reflections on this day. So, Scott, I understand that you have a, a guest with you. Well, Patty, actually, we're not going to go to that guest right now. She's a little bit emotional. Um, Massbeth here in Queens is a small community, as you can see behind me. It's a slice of small town America right here in the middle of New York City. We're only about 13 kilometers from Ground Zero and the World Trade Center. But this community, this small community, is directly connected to those attacks 10 years ago today. The firehouse here responded, like many around the city, to the attacks. They rushed those 13 kilometers, 20 firemen from this community down there. Only one returned, and this is their story. People here like to think of Maspeth as a small town within New York City. Hey, it's a great place to live. Uh, it's this very small community that uh, you walk down the street and you get to know everybody, uh, you know, whether it be on a work day or uh, an off day. But even with its small town charm, it's connected to the big city. Beyond the obvious geographical ties, Maspeth played a major symbolic role during the 9-11 attacks. This small blue collar community is home to the Firehouse of Squad 288 and Hazardous Materials Squad 1. Ten years ago on September 11th, the Firehouse responded to calls for help down at the World Trade Center. 20 men climbed into their trucks and raced the 13 kilometers to the scene in Lower Manhattan. Only one came back. Of any firehouse that responded to the scene at the World Trade Center, this one in Maspeth suffered the biggest loss. Darlena Manzion's husband is a fireman in a squad near 288. This weekend, she'll be thinking of the Maspeth families who were not as lucky as hers. And they say that 10 years, like this is the big one, it's supposed to be, you know, everybody's supposed to just gather together and, and you know, it's like a healing process, but I, I can't even fathom, you know, I mean, every day that my husband walks out the door, to, you know, to go to work, you never know. They're heroes, they're all heroes. And what they've done is just, you know, amazing. So, I mean, uh, the guys from 288, like I said, and my husband as well, these people weren't even on duty at the time, you know? And I, I think it takes a lot of courage and, you know, uh, it, it, for what they've done to go down there when they're not even working and just to, to, you know, lend a helping hand. And those who lent that helping hand are such a part of Maspeth that the community 
named their local public school number 58, School of Heroes, to honor those in uniform who lost their lives on 9-11. And we are out live in front of that school right now. Now, we've been told by the community here that this school was under construction on September of 2001. Uh, the workers stopped when the attacks happened. They were actually on the roof of this school and could actually see the towers come down from that roof. It reopened. It opened, I should say, exactly one year later, September 2002. And they decided to name it the School of Heroes for all those in this community who died. Now, it wasn't just firemen and hazardous material uh, workers that, that died that day. Jennifer Mazata, she's a local girl. She worked just down the street from where we're standing. She got a job at Cantor Fitzgerald and World Trade Cent Center number one. She died in that attack, and someone came and placed flowers here on the street that is named after her. So this very small community out here in Queens directly connected to these attacks and uh, the community here. There's a small ceremony being held in the firehouse as we speak. Later on today at a park nearby, there we're being told that thousands are going to gather for a candlelight vigil. Patty. Scott, thank you so much. And those sorts of services are really happening all throughout yeah. the United States, yeah, small sure. towns, big cities all throughout the United States. All right, let's join Scott Heidler now. He's in Brooklyn in New York. And Scott, earlier you were in a neighborhood hit particularly hard on 9-11, weren't you? Yes, we were, Darren. That was in Queens, Mass Beth, Queens, which is about a 20-minute drive from here in Brooklyn. We're right on the water on the East River and actually off into the distance to give you an idea how close we are. You can see World Trade Center 1 being constructed off in the distance and then just over off to the right, Jeff or Cameron can pan that way. That's the Brooklyn Bridge and many of us remember the images of thousands of people streaming across that bridge after those attacks on 9-11 because there was no way to get out of the city. Now, so we, we visited a neighborhood that was directly hit by these attacks. Uh, Brooklyn here also was hit by it, but uh, we would like to look a little bit more into how America as a nation is reacting to 9-11 just immediately after, after it and then now in the 10 years since. To discuss this further, we're going to bring in Thomas Hopker. Now, he is a photographer with renowned agency Magnum, and he took one of the uh, images now of 9-11 that's being called an icon. Kind of briefly describe how and when you took this photo. Well, exactly 10 years ago, maybe by the hour, uh, I'm living up uh, in northern Manhattan, and uh, I had a hub, and I, I, the news broke, and I watched TV. Of course, I wanted to go. I'm a photographer and a news photographer. And um, I couldn't go because the subways didn't run. So I decided to take the car out, and I drove down here, which takes a while, through uh, Queens and Brooklyn. And on the way, I tried to collect pictures, you know. I saw the, the plume of smoke in the sky, and uh, I was just trying to get whatever I could. Why did this, this scene capture, capture your attention specifically? Well, suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw that brief scene of young people sitting on a bench uh, under trees. And I just got out of the car, and I took three pictures exactly, because it was a little bit of strange, you know. They looked very peaceful, and the drama developing behind them. And then I drove on and forgot about it. And then I tried to go to the Brooklyn Bridge here and cross the Brooklyn Bridge, and I couldn't. And I was kind of stuck. And um, in a way, I, I missed the, the, the closeness. I didn't really get close to the event. And that image that, that we're looking at and that you've been uh, speaking about, um, you didn't release it immediately. It wasn't published immediately. Why was it? It was four years later, I believe. Yeah, simply the next day I went to my agency and saw what my colleagues had taken. And they had captured the horror, the, the excitement, uh, and the drama of the day, and I didn't. So when I got home and looked at my pictures, I felt this is not it. It's not an important picture. I put it aside. I put it into what I call the B box, except uh, in, as opposed to the A box or the better pictures. And I forgot about it. And only uh, like four years later, a, a curator for my show, upcoming retrospective show in Munich, Germany, came. And he looked through my, my work and he found this picture. And he said, listen, this is a very strange and, and uh, puzzling image. And, and uh, I started to tell him the story about it. And then I understood this picture had something uh, which the others didn't have. And it created quite a controversy. I mean, it even prompted the, the, the reaction to it not being published. Um, it prompted you to, to kind of step out and, and not necessarily defend, but explain your situation yeah. and explain why you didn't yeah. publish yeah. this immediately yeah. after. Yeah. Well, why is yeah. that? Well, it was published finally in the exhibition in the catalog and uh, in, in Europe, not in the U.S. 
Uh, but these people saw the picture, the, the ones who were in the picture, and they said, uh, this makes us look like idiots, you know? We are sitting at the moment of one of the greatest catastrophes in mankind, and we look like we are on a vacation. And uh, I wrote them back, I'm very sorry, this is how it looked, but I'm ab absolutely convinced that you were discussing what was going on. Of course, you were aware. But some magazines said, uh, these young people have no idea what's going on around them, which is, of course, wrong. But it was a snapshot of reality. And in a way, it became a symbol of, uh, you can say, paradise lost. You know, they, they sit there in the sunshine, it's very nice around them, and the, the dark, black cloud is just behind them. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for joining us, Thomas. And yes, and a lot of dialogue uh, created by this image this is the ambivalence in the United States 10 years on and exactly how people here in the United States are digesting this, this major catastrophe that happened 10 years ago. Darren? Now, we thought we'd show you a shot of New York skyline, one of the most famous city skylines in the world. Across Lower Manhattan and over the East River is the borough of Brooklyn. Al Jazeera's Scott Heidler is there for us. Tell us about the day's events there, Scott. Yes, she had. Well, Brooklyn here, yes, it's a bit of a quiet day so far, but earlier in the day, we were at a very small community in Queens, Mass Beth, Queens, and that's just about 13 kilometers from where you are, she had ground zero. This small com community hit very hard by 9-11. They lost 19 firemen from a small firehouse there, and this is their story. People here like to think of Mass Beth as a small town within New York City. Hey, it's a great place to live. Uh, it's this very small community that uh, you walk down the street and you get to know everybody, uh, you know, whether it be on a work day or uh, an off day. But even with its small town charm, it's connected to the big city. Beyond the obvious geographical ties, Mass Beth played a major symbolic role during the 9-11 attacks. This small blue-collar community is home to the Firehouse of Squad 288 and Hazardous Materials Squad 1. Ten years ago on September 11th, the Firehouse responded to calls for help down at the World Trade Center. 20 men climbed into their trucks and raced the 13 kilometers to the scene in Lower Manhattan. Only one came back. Of any firehouse that responded to the scene at the World Trade Center, this one in Maspeth suffered the biggest loss. Darlena Manzion's husband is a fireman in a squad near 288. This weekend, she'll be thinking of the Maspeth families who were not as lucky as hers. And they say that 10 years, like this is the big one, it's supposed to be, you know, everybody's supposed to just gather together and, and you know, it's like a healing process, but I, I can't even fathom, you know, I mean, every day that my husband walks out the door, to, you know, to go to work, you never know. They're heroes, they're all heroes, and what they've done is just, you know, amazing. So, I mean, uh, the guys from 288, like I said, and my husband as well, these people weren't even on duty at the time, you know, and I, I think it takes a lot of courage and, you know, uh, it, it, for what they've done to go down there when they're not even working and just to, to, you know, lend a helping hand. And those who lent that helping hand are such a part of Maspeth that the community named their local public school number 58, School of Heroes, to honor those in uniform who lost their lives on 9-11. Back out here live in Brooklyn. Now this community, this borough of the five boroughs in New York City, all were connected to 9-11. You can see behind me the Brooklyn Bridge. We all remember those images of thousands of people streaming across the bridge from Lower Manhattan once the attacks took place. You can see the, the view of Lower Manhattan in the background. Now someone who was here when that happened, Tahani Salah, she was a high school student when the World Trade Center was struck, and actually, you were actually seeing this, witnessing this from your high school classroom window. Tell us a little bit about that. Right, as it was happening, we were sitting in Earth Science that morning, and our teacher was basically going through what the class would be like since it was the beginning of the school year, and how he sort of felt on, you know, learning about new things, and his face sort of changed, and we didn't know what was really happening until he started to mummer some words to turn around and look for ourselves, and. Our faces just were you know, totally in awe. And you're saying you can also see, we're able to see the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, through a window in your apartment. And now we look over and it's the skyline has changed. How does that make you feel when you look? I mean, you've, 
this has been 10 years. How does it make you feel now that you see finally, you know, there's a, something coming up from that, from that uh, ground zero? You feel a little emptiness, you know? Uh, you look out and, and you remember what it was like growing up seeing these two beautiful creations standing right there and what they stand for and what all this city stands for and the unity that we believe in. And, and to see them gone, it was a tragedy for us to see, you know, us have this really big thing ripped from us. Now, you're a Muslim American, and, and when you, know, you and I were speaking before, Ed, just as we were standing uh, in the park talking, people were turning around, you know, because your, your, your appearance is different than a lot of people here, in this park at least. How does that make you feel after 9-11, right after 9-11 and then maybe a couple years after uh, to where we are now? How did that make you feel as a Muslim American going through this? You know, it's really interesting to, to see the dynamic how people's ignorance sort of changes, right? And they sort of to pick up on things that we were here too. We've lost people as well. And that this tragedy is something that happened on this day and we'll forever remember that. But to go to the tragedies that happen all across the world every day from then till now and, and beyond that is, uh, you know, it's part of who you are. It's become your culture. It's become your reality to figure out ways to constantly just work through those things and have people understand that you are someone who's, you know, affected by this, but also affected by the other you know, just as important tragedies happening every day. Yeah, she having that just kind of an example of just the, the fabric that is New York City, so very diverse, so many different people living here. She have. Thank you, Scope. We're looking at the red, white, and blue, yeah. uh, the, the new uh, tower going up in place of the World Trade Center. But he's also going to talk about what hasn't changed, we believe. And what we expect he's going to say is in the 10 years, the nation's ongoing commitment to liberty and freedom and values have held the country together. Now, that might be a tough position for the president to take in light of all what we've seen in the Arab Spring. But uh, you can bet when it comes to President Barack Obama, the one thing we do know about this president is he can give a good yeah, speech. Yeah, it'll be a cracking speech. All right, uh, Patty, a good work on that. Uh, and before we get to the president, Let's go live now to Scott Heidler, who is in uh, Liberty State Park. That's in Jersey City. Yes, Tony. Yeah, we've uh, kind of gone around the horn, as they say uh, today. We were reporting on the east side of the island of Manhattan. We were in Queens. We were in Brooklyn. Now we're in New Jersey at Liberty State Park. People have gathered here to look at what's over my shoulder. That's the tribute in light, uh, f uh, two lights going straight up to uh, resemble the Twin Towers. Um, a very emotional day we experienced across uh, two boroughs and now in uh, New Jersey. We started in Queens. We went to a small community, Massbeth, that lost 19 firefighters on 9-11. They've dedicated their high school, um, a new school that was built just a year after September 11th. We visited a street that was named after a young girl, a 22-year-old girl who was a local town. She used to work as a clerk on the main street there. She made it big, they told us, in that community. She was working in World Trade Center uh, 1 when it was hit by American Airlines Flight 11. She was killed in that. A very emotional time there. They're holding a cad candlelight vigil tonight in that small community. Then we moved to Brooklyn. We spoke with a uh, woman, a Muslim-American woman, who was in high school, who actually watched the Twin Towers crumble from her school window um, and what she experienced as a Muslim American in the years after that um, and what she hopes going forward. And she was very hopeful going forward that, uh, that, that uh, New York speaks with one, vo one voice. It's a very uh, ethnically diverse city, but that they we will speak with one voice at this, that it should be looked at as, as a unifying um, situation since 9-11. Um, and she experienced that. She has faced some discrimination, but she has experienced much more unity than um, uh, discrimination. Now we're here in, in New Jersey. This is Liberty State Park, and people have come out to gather to, to see the tribute in light behind me. It, uh, a little bit of a low cloud ceiling, so you can't see, uh, see it probably in, in further places further afield, but uh, on a clear night, you can see that 90 kilometers away. Tonight, though, people coming out to see that, to pay tribute to the 10th anniversary of 9-11. Tony? All right, Scott, thank you very much. And, and let's do this as we bring you. You know, there is this really amazing sight here. It is the tribute lights that yeah, uh, yeah. look like what the Twin Towers did. Now, Scott Heidler, our own Scott Heidler, has moved location. He's in Liberty State Park in Jersey City, and I think he's got a very good view of this. Scott? 
Yes, Patty, as you, we saw from that report, we've been reporting for uh, today's events on the east side of the island of Manhattan. Now we're on the west side, and I'm going to have Jeff, our cameraman, pan over, and you can see the people have gathered here at Liberty State Park in New Jersey to look at just that, the tribute in light. It just became much more visible, I should say, over the last maybe 15, 20 minutes. You can see those two streams going straight up normally when there's not a low cloud cover like we have tonight. You'd be able to see that over 90 kilometers away. Tonight we have a little bit of a low cloud cover, but it really illuminates it uh, just at the very tops of that. And again, as I mentioned, we are in New Jersey, and like the communities we visited earlier today on the east side of the island of Manhattan, New Jersey was definitely involved and directly connected to these attacks. And we have someone here to talk about that, Richard Waddingham. He is from just over here in Jersey City. And Richard, you you were here. You've, you've lived here for 14 years. You were here when the attacks happened on 9-11. What was that like looking from this side of the river, this side of the Hudson River, over right there? Because it's very, very close. Uh, yes, I, I live just probably five blocks or four blocks from the, uh, the Hudson River, right across from the World Trade Center, or where it uh, used to be. And uh, I didn't realize anything was going on until after both planes had hit. And by the time we came down to the river, they'd already fallen. And... Uh, the whole lower part of the island was covered with smoke. You, you couldn't you couldn't see anything. Uh, people were coming up out of the ground, covered with ash. Some um, having to be helped along had obviously uh, been injured. And you helped along in this process too, though, right? Yes, I uh, I stayed into the evening and uh, helped uh, ferry supplies uh, across the Hudson River down to. Um, Battery uh, Park, uh, about where the lights are coming up from uh, right now, and we took bottled water, cases and cases of bottled water, and then later on went up to where uh, the actual site was to the Winter Garden and help unload cases of rubber gloves and medical supplies. And let's talk about this. Let's talk about the skyline that, that you know so very well. You were saying that you could see it from, from where where you live. It's changed a lot now. You saw the the towers come down, and now you can make out the tower in the background that is coming up, the two towers that are coming up. How does that make you feel seeing now that the skyline is changing, now going up, not going down? Well, it's really reassuring because for, for years, uh, I would take the PATH train into the World Trade Center site where, uh, where it stops, and it was nothing but a hole for years and years. And now, finally, to see it rising uh, above the skyline is... Uh, is really reassuring, but at the same time a little unnerving because once again there's a this rising symbol and target basically um, right there in Lower Manhattan. Now the, the, this tribute in light started uh, just six months after the Twin Towers fell, um, so you've seen this plenty of times, I'm sure. Any more significance today? Tenth anniversary, seeing these lights again today? Well. It being 10 years, of course, it, it takes on uh, an added significance, I think, a full decade, um, thinking about how some children have grown up um, really knowing nothing but uh, this time in our history after the attacks. And, uh, and it's um, somewhat disturbing, but it's always, uh, I guess, uh, well, actually, it's... It's an emotional it's, time, yeah. It's a little upsetting uh, year after year. But as time goes on, it's more with a sense of um, remembrance and reverence. Not such stabbing sadness. Um, and what do you think? There, there has been some uh, discussion, I won't say controversy, but there's been some discussion of keeping these kind of tributes, these very high-profile tributes, going forward. Um, in some cases, those who are more directly involved, say, than yourself or myself being, being from New York, that that kind of rehashes the event for those who are directly involved, who, who lost family members, that maybe it's not necessary to, to, to do this year and year, year and year out. Obviously, this year maybe can be an, uh, an exception because it's the 10th anniversary. Do you feel as though that that's true, that, that it should be, okay, the tributes are made, the building is there, the monuments are there, should we try and move on? Um, Yes, in a way, I, I, I sort of think that now that the visitor center and the monuments are there for people to go and uh, have their own 
private time and remembrance uh, that we don't need so many public displays uh, of, uh, of um, like you say, well, I don't know if you said, but sort of rehashing the, the, the pain and the uh, event over and over again. I, I don't really care to ever see the same uh, footage that we've seen for 10 years played ad nauseum. Um, I, I, I've, I personally have seen it enough. I, I, I won't forget it. I don't need to be reminded. A, a tribute in lights okay. uh, is not uh, anything uh, too exaggerated. I think it's very tasteful, and, and it only lasts for a couple of days. So I think it, this could go on uh, once a year, you know, uh, same as blowing out candles on your birthday or something like that. The, the, a, a flame, a light, I think is inspiring. Yeah, and those lights behind us now are still very inspiring. Uh, Tony, Patty, back to you. Yeah. Scott Heidler, Scott Heidler, thank you so much for some really tremendous work today. You know, it's pretty amazing. We can see the lights from our perspective, yeah. but it doesn't show you until you're